Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be uh, in a new series under the Old Testament prophets. First of all, I'd like to talk about the Old Testament designations for prophet. Uh, the term itself, prophet, the Hebrew word is navi, and it literally means a one who's been called, a called one. Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1 uh, has that term when it says, The Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. And now Moses, we normally think, is one of the first, one of the early prophets. But in this case, he's getting an, ap, an, an acting upgrade. He's acting out of class. He's going to be acting as though he's God, uh, not in a full sense, but just in as he comes before Pharaoh. And instead of speaking to Pharaoh, it's going to be Aaron who will be do, doing the speaking. So Aaron is going to be the prophet of Moses, who himself is the prophet of God. And he's been called to do that, and so has Aaron. Next, we see the designation a seer, and this is seeing, excuse the pun, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9, where we read, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he used to say, come and let us go to the seer. And then by explanation, it says, for he who is called a prophet now was formerly called a seer. So this apparently was an old designation, and you would go to the seer because he would see the things that that God was doing. Next, we have the term the servant, and we see this in 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning verse 36, uh, where Elijah, he's on Mount Carmel, and we see at the time of the offering of the eating and sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near, and he said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm sorry, Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Israel, you are God in Israel, and that I am Notice, here it is, I am your servant, and I've done all these things at your word. And so, here Elijah, acting as prophet, but he is taking for himself this designation, the servant of God. By the way, when you go to to, um, to Israel and up on Mount Carmel, uh, it was uh, so humorous when Paul and I first went there, uh, they had this big statue of Elijah. And my my first response was to laugh out loud. I said, you know, Elijah himself would be rolling over in his grave to see a statue and an idol of himself, not that they're worshiping it. Um, but it is rather humorous to see that. He was also known as a messenger, and this is an interesting designation because the Hebrew word for messenger is malak, and that's the same word that's also used for an angel. An angel is a divine messenger, and and the prophet, I suppose you could call him a human messenger of the divine, but he was a messenger. And then finally, the prophet sometimes is called the man of God. He was God's man, the one that God had, uh, had brought and was speaking on behalf of God, uh, he was God's man. He was the one who, who was there on behalf of the Lord. Now, the functions of the Old Testament prophet are best seen uh, when they, we see them uh, acting both as a preacher. In fact, I would suggest that the prophets are to the Old Testament what the epistles are to the New Testament. You think, well, why not the book of Revelation? That's a book of prophecy. Uh, but no, the prophets oftentimes were functioning as preachers. They would take the law and they would apply it to the people of their day. And the epistles do the same thing, where, where whether it's Paul or one of the other or writers of the general epistles. They are taking the words of Jesus and they're applying it to the church in their day. And so the prophets that were like that, they functioned as preachers, but they also functioned as predictors. That is, they would they would tell the future. That's the, the prophetic part. But their prophetic ministry was also foretelling the present, not just the future. And in the present, they would be telling people how they ought to live, how they ought to obey the Lord, how they ought to be following and hearing the law. Now, the distinctive roles of the priest versus the prophet, uh, you, you can take these two two uh, positions and actually contrast them together. They were, they were both legitimate positions under the Old Testament. The priest represented the people to God. And the prophet came from the opposite direction. He represented God to the people. That is, the priest, he would come with all the sacrifices and the offerings. Uh, he would minister the, the ceremonies of worship as he came on behalf of the people, offering up sacrifices to God, representing the people to God. The prophet by contrast, would represent the proclamation of the word of God to the people. So he came from God addressing the people. 
Now, what did prophets do? Well, they received messages from God. They were also called by God, and and sometimes they'd be. You actually had prophets that were were minding their own business and just going about a daily life. And God showed up and said, "You're going to go and speak a message." And they said, "Okay." And they, and they did that. So they would receive a message from God. They'd be called by him. They would write scriptures. And the, what we'll be looking at in this series, we'll be looking at the prophets who, who provided their prophecies in writing. Now, you have other prophets. For example, we don't have a thing that Elijah or Elisha, and they were both prophets, but we, we don't have anything that they wrote. And so we'll be looking uh, in this series at the written prophets. They wrote scriptures. And they call the people to follow the Lord, much like a preacher does in that sense. Now, there's a covenant dynamic with the prophets, where, and these covenant dynamics are seen oftentimes in the Near East uh, when we look at the covenant ideas and diplomats uh, between countries, where, where you would have somebody who would come from one country to another representing the king of the country that, from which he had come, representing that king to other kings and reminding them of the importance of keeping the covenant. This is assuming that there had been a covenant treaty, a covenant relationship between two kings, and they had those things back then. Uh, sometimes they were certain uh, covenants were called covenants of parity, where you had two equal kings. But more often than not, there was a big king. Uh, he was known as the suzerain, and he would be speaking to the smaller king, the vassal king. And you would have a diplomat who would come and remind the smaller king, hey, you're you're supposed to keep your promises and and you made a covenant and I'm here to remind you of that. And these covenant dynamics were there in Israel and they were among the prophets because God is the big king and he had made a covenant. He had cut a covenant. He'd entered into a covenant with his people, with his people Israel. And so the prophets there were the divine diplomats coming from God to the people. Now, in our realm of Old Testament history, if we go all the way back to Abraham, he's roughly around 2000 BC, we have the period of the patriarchs, and of course, uh, from there all the way to Exodus and coming into the land, that's uh, the, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the books that we refer to as the Torah, the law. Uh, sometimes we call those the Pentateuch, the five books. And then you have Joshua and Judges and, and Ruth and First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, the historical books. And it's the historical books that are going to take us into the section of the prophets so that we have uh, the poets. But what we're going to be looking at is the prophetical books. And notice they don't begin even with the kings of Judah and Israel, because we have kings, we have prophets like Elijah and Elisha, who they're prophets, but they're not writing. And so we're going to be looking at the prophetic books. And they will take us in this, into this period of the kings of the divided kingdom. The kingdom's already divided. Uh, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And then Israel will be taken into captivity. And then Judah will be taken into captivity. That's 586 BC. But then they will return. And the prophets, they, they encompass that entire section, including the return. Because they'll come back from the Babylonian captivity. And we'll have the last three of the minor prophets. Uh, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi will be prophets of the return, prophets of the after the return from Babylon. Lastly, we want to talk about the idea of high and low determination. And and I'm borrowing that phrase from one of my old professors, Dr. Richard Pratt. Uh, He came up up with the terminology. It's, It's taken from Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 3 where we see the word of the Lord, which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I shall announce my words to you. And so Jeremiah says, I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. You know, when you're when you're making pottery, you, you get a wheel and it sort of spins this blob of, of clay around and around, and then you put your hands on it and it gradually molds it and shapes it. But if, if you don't do it just right, sometimes the, a, a portion of that can fall over and, and there's nothing to, to do with it except put your hands and mush it all up and start over again. And that's what took place here. And so he was going to make one kind of, of, of vessel, 
But instead, that wasn't working out, so he just he lumped it back up and he started over again, and he made it into a very different kind of vessel, according to his choice, as it pleased him to make. Verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment, I may speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I I planned to bring on it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. Here's what's going on. He says, here I speak concerning a nation to destroy. That's a prediction. God says, I'm going to destroy this nation. And then the contingency arises in which they turn from their evil as a result of my speaking. And God says, instead, I'm not going to destroy it like I promised I would. Instead, I will relent of the, of the calamity. So it goes from, from bad to good if they turn from their evil. Conversely, the next verse went on to say, if I speak concerning a nation to plant it. Here I, I, I'm saying, I'm, I'm promising to plant this nation. I'm going to build it up. It's going to be a great nation. But if they do evil and do not obey, then I will think better of the good. And so notice how uh, what was predicted does not come to pass depending on the contingency. If, if, if it, if they either turn from their evil or if they don't turn from, from their evil, even though I prophesied, the result will be the polar opposite. It will be very different. Now we have there the, what I call the uncertainty principle. Sometimes I like to call it the, the who knows principle. For example, in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 22, and this is the instance where David had sinned uh, with Bathsheba and had had murdered uh, her husband and then taken her. This was after an adulterous affair. And then the child was born to them. And God had sent his prophet to say, the child is going to die. And David had entered a period of fasting. And, and then after the child died, he said, well, okay, it's, it's time to eat now. And, and his, his servants just couldn't understand what was going on. And he explains, and he said, for I said, who knows, this is why I call it the who, who knows principle, who knows the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. Now, it didn't work out that way, but, but there was uncertainty. And even though God had said, I'm going, the, the child's going to die, David says, you know, you never know until, until it happens. Maybe if I repent, the child will live. And now, it did not happen. It's not saying that it had to take place that way, and it didn't. A second example, and we'll look at this uh, further later on, Jonah chapter 3, verse 9, where the king of Nineveh says, and this is after Nineveh is told, uh, you're going to be destroyed. <laughs> well, he says, let's, let's go and repent. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. A third place, Joel chapter 2 and verse 14, where the people, Joel calls the people to repent and to proclaim a solemn fast and turn back to the Lord. And he says, for who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. Now, again, I'm borrowing these terms from Richard Pratt, Dr. Richard Pratt. Uh, He talks about high and low determination, where you have four different types of prophecy. There are those conditional predictions, which are very very clearly stated. It starts with an if. If you do this, uh, then I will do that. And if you do that. So those are conditional predictions. Secondly, there are unqualified predictions, and we'll explain what each of these are in in a bit more, uh, and we'll give examples as well. But you have conditional predictions, you have unqualified predictions, you have confirmed prediction predictions, and finally, we're going to see sworn predictions. So all four of these. First of all, the conditional predictions, and we see one in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Here it is. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, 
you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So notice it very clearly. If you do this, then here's going to be the result. But if you do that, then here's going to be the result. It's a conditional prediction, and it's a very obvious conditional prediction because the condition is spelled out. Next, we have the unqualified prediction. And we, we mentioned a bit earlier the, the case of Jonah. Here's the prophecy of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3 and verse 4, where Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, he doesn't say, unless you repent. He doesn't say, say anything about repentance. He just says, forty days from now, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And remember, we, we already said, the king of Nineveh says, well, let's go repent. Who knows? But Jonah didn't say that. Jonah gave it as an unqualified prediction. There was no, if you do this, then I'll do that. An unqualified prediction, which turned out to be conditional, but it was not stated as such at the time that the prophecy was made. Now, that's an important point that a prophecy can be conditional without overtly being stated that it is conditional. Don't miss that point. There are a great many prophecies of the scriptures that are unqualified as to their predictions. They're, they're, just, they're just prophecies. God says, I'm going to do this. And a great many of them just might be conditional. In other words, God's going to do this if things don't change either for the better or for the worse, depends on the, on the prophecy. And, but conditional prophecies are not always stated as being conditional. In fact, perhaps a great many prophecies which are conditional are not stated as such. Next, we have confirmed prediction, where the prediction is confirmed by some sort of sign. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2, where the Lord answered me, this is Habakkuk speaking, and said, record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who, read it, who reads it may run. In other words, you're going to take this prediction and you're going to write it down. It's going to be, you know, sometimes we say it's written on stone. Well, it's going to be written on stone or at least on clay, on some sort of tablet. He goes on to say, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Now, I'm not saying that it can't be conditional, but notice how it's confirmed. There's a confirmation given. It, it, sounds, it, it sounds much more sure where the condi there's no conditional aspect that seems to be in view. And then finally, we have Sworn predictions. A sworn prediction, Isaiah chapter 45, beginning in verse 22, where God says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. Now, when you swear by something, what you are saying is, if this doesn't come to pass, then the thing by which I am swearing, may it be destroyed. That's, that's covenant language. When you were making a covenant, you would kill an animal. And what you were saying is, if I don't keep my part of the covenant, what happened to that animal is supposed to happen to me. I am swearing by my own life. And that's what God says. I have sworn by myself. God's saying, if I don't keep my covenant, if I don't keep my word, if I don't keep my oath, then let me cease to exist. Notice the rest of the verse. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, and here's, here's, the, here's the promise, that to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Now, Paul quotes this passage in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2. He says, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And the implication is that that's not merely conditional. That's really going to happen. Now, how it happens, that can be a very different question. Will every knee bow to him because they are, they are lovingly obedient, because they have been redeemed? Or will there be knees that bow to him because they are being judged? You see, how it happens is not being described, but it will happen. And you can take that to the bank because God has sworn an oath.